Brooklyn. Good evening and welcome to the City Council meeting of June 3rd, 2021. It is 8, 10 p.m. City Clerk Preamble, please. This meeting is compliant with the Governor's Executive Order N-29-20 issued on March 17, 2020, allowing for deviation of teleconference rules required by the Brown Act. The purpose of this is to provide the safest environment for staff council members and the public while allowing for public participation. The public may address the council using exclusively remote public comment options. The council may take action on any item listed in the agenda. Members of the public may view the city council meeting by logging into the Zoom webinar listed below. City council meetings can also be viewed live and are on demand via the city's YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Brisbane CA or on Comcast channel 27. Archive videos can be replayed on the city's website, brisbaneca.org forward slash meetings. The city council meeting will be an exclusively virtual meeting. The city council agenda materials may be viewed online at brisbaneca.org at least 24 hours prior to a special meeting and at least 72 hours prior to a regular meeting. Meeting participants are encouraged to submit public comments in writing in advance of the meeting. Aside from commenting while in the Zoom webinar, the following email and text line will also be monitored during the meeting and public comments received will be noted for the record during oral communications one and two or during an item. Email ipadia at brisbaneca.org, text 628-219-2922. Join the Zoom webinar at zoom.us with the ID 9919362866 pass code 123456 and the call in number at 16699009128 if you need special assistance to participate in this meeting please contact me at 4155082113 notification in advance of the meeting will enable the city to make reasonable arrangements to ensure accessibility to this meeting thank you Thank you. Um, item number one, it's 8.12 p.m. called order. This is our first meeting of June. This month, we would like to recognize June as Pride Month. And on June 19th, it's Juneteenth. It is a holiday celebrating the emancipation of African-Americans from slavery in the US. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, item number two, roll call. City Clerk, roll call, please. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Lentz. Here. Council Member Mackin. Here. Council Member O'Connell? Here. And Mayor Cunningham? I'm here. Thank you. Um, can we get a report out from closed session, please? Yes, Madam Mayor, thank you. The council addressed uh, threat and litigation in closed session, and direction was given on, on follow up. No direction was given to take any formal action. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, item three is adoption of agenda. And I just want to acknowledge the, the tragedy at the BTA uh, site um, in San Jose and how horrendous that was for everybody involved. Can I get a first and second to approve the agenda, please? So moved. Second. Um, roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lentz. Aye. Council Member Mackin. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Um, item A is the proclamation dedicating June as Pride Month, as we always do, and really the entire year. Here is our proclamation that I will now read into the record. Pride Month Proclamation. Whereas the City Council of the City of Brisbane recognizes and proclaims the month of June 2021 as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, 
and queer LGBTQ Pride Month throughout the city. And whereas the city of Brisbane joins the county of San Mateo to observe Pride Month with a pride flag raising ceremony to honor the history of the LGBTQ liberation movement and to support the rights of all citizens to experience equality and freedom from discrimination. And whereas the rainbow flag is wildly recognized as a symbol of pride, inclusion, and support for the social movements that advocate the LGBTQ people in society, and whereas all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, LGBTQ individuals have had a measurable impact on the culture, civic, and economic success of our country. And whereas the city of Brisbane is committed to supporting visibility, dignity and equality for LGBTQ people in our diverse community. And whereas while society at large increasingly supports LGBTQ equality, it is essential to acknowledge the need for education and awareness remains vital to end discrimination and prejudice. And whereas the nation was founded on the principle that every individual has infinite dignity and worth and the city council calls upon the people of the municipality to embrace this principle and work to eliminate prejudice everywhere it exists. And whereas celebrating Pride Month influences awareness and provides support and advocacy for San Mateo County's LGBTQ community and it's an opportunity to take action and engage in dialogue to strengthen alliances, build acceptance and advance equal rights. Now, therefore be it resolved that the city council hereby proclaims the month of June, 2021 as Pride Month in support of LGBTQ community. Be it further resolved that the rainbow flag will be flown year round in our city, recognizing all LGBTQ residents whose influential and lasting contributions to our neighborhoods make the city of Brisbane a vibrant community in which to live, work, and visit. Dated June 3rd, 2021. Um, to receive this proclamation, we have Director Tanya Beat from San Mateo County's LGBTQ Commission and the Commission on the Status of Women. If I could hand it to you, I would. Thank you. And, um... Apologies for my background. It was from a meeting yesterday that I was in. You know, it's June, so LGBTQ looks, looks month. fabulous to me, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, good evening, Mayor Cunningham, city council members, and city staff. Thank you for inviting me to accept the Brisbane Pride Month proclamation. My name is Tanya Beat. My pronouns are, are she, her, and I'm, I'm the director of the San Mateo County's LGBTQ Commission. On behalf of that commission, I wanna thank the city of Brisbane for this proclamation, declaring June as Pride Month. You join a movement of inclusion and visibility that impacts LGBTQ residents here and throughout the county. Since late March, the commission has invited cities to recognize Pride Month in a variety of ways that best fits their communities. All cities have issued a Pride Month proclamation. As of today, only one city has declined flying the pride flag. But more importantly, I wanna highlight the fact that Brisbane is the only city in this county to fly the pride flag year round. When I heard that, I was just blown away. So I just really wanna thank the city for being leaders in this inclusion mo movement because it, in it impacts not just LGBTQ residents, but everyone in your community. My one last point is um, actually an invitation. Should residents of Brisbane wanna take part in Pride, we invite them to join us for a week of virtual events, which actually start on Monday. We're actually on Sunday. Sunday, the county fair is, is holding their Pride Day. So you're welcome to, of course, attend that. And then the week we have virtual events. So the website uh, to join us is MC, I'm sorry, smcpridecelebration.com. So thank you for your support and I wish you a very good evening. Tanya, thanks so much. Really nice to see you in a different environment. Yes, thanks. thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Okay.
Um, okay, we move on to item five, oral communications number one. Um, Clerk Padilla, do we have any member of the public wishing to speak on an item not on the agenda? Members of the public, if you wish to make public comment, please um, use the raise your hand function and Zoom. Uh, Madam Mayor, I have not received any text messages or written correspondences, or I don't see any hands up at this time. Okay. Thank you. Then moving on to item six, consent calendar. Um, item B, accept investment report as of April 2021. C, approve resolution, uh, resolution, resolution number 2021-36 prohibiting parking at the BCDC public parking area within the shore at Sierra Point between the hours of 2 and 4 a.m. Item D, acknowledge South San Francisco Scavengers 2021 rate increases and Recology Brisbane 2021 decision to forego a request for a rate increase. And item E, approve resolution, resolution 2021-37, establishing the 2021 business license tax for liquid storage facilities as to Kinder Morgan SFPP. Can I get a first and second to approve the consent calendars item B? Madam, Madam Mayor, I would like to approve items B, D, and E. And I have a quick question on item C, so I'd like to pull that. Uh, I need to, well, are we going to do oral communications one? Do we do that? Yes, we just yeah. did that. Oh, okay. So um, I need to recuse myself from item D. So um, maybe we can do... I'll what change the... my motion to approve yeah. items um, B and E. Okay, and then we can vote. And then Ing Ingrid, can you put me in the waiting room? <coughs> or, yes. All right, I'll second, second your motion, Jerry. No oh, second? Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin. Oh, please unmute. Sorry, aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. So shall we have a conversation about item C that Terry wanted to pull? Sure. And then, then we'll go on to D and, and put Madison in there. Sure. On the, on, the on the resolution um, for prohibiting parking, in the BCDC area. Mm -hmm. I just had a question on the staff report. Um, don't we already have a resolution or a um, no parking allowed between two and 4 a.m. on the rest of that area also? So where we are restricting parking from 2 a.m. to 4 p.m., ma'am, is the Northern part of shared use parking. So it's the northernmost parking lot. It's the one where people are occasionally doing sideshows. This is restrictive for the 10 spaces on the shore property that are actually on their private property that have been mandated to be placed there and made available to users of the Bay Trail. Okay, and and that speak and I, I heard that it was due to crimes, but that the cars are just not moving. Those two tend to be working in parallel, ma'am. It's when we have cars that are non-movers, we tend to have people that are using it as a base for nefarious activities. And I mean, are we saying that they're sleeping there or is it that they're doing other things? Or the I think I'm a, I, I know some information, but I think I'm gonna let Commander Garcia speak on what sort of uh, crimes the police department have been dealing with out there. Uh, thank you, Randy. Um, yeah, we've had numerous occasions where Vehicles will park there, um, not sleeping, um, basically drinking. And when we contact them, uh, we really can't get them out of there because they're allowed to park there. But in reality, it, we actually arrest them because they are doing drugs there. Okay, thank you. That's the only clarification I needed. And unless 
I would be happy to make the motion to approve items uh, C. Second. I'll call, please. On item C. Item C, Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lentz. Aye. Council Member Mackin. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Now, if we. Madison. Before I get removed, I have to, I, ha I think I have to state the reason for the recusal. So I just am um, recusing myself out of an abundance of caution and to avoid the perception of a potential conflict of interest. So thank you. With that, I'll make a motion. Oh, where did Terry go? We we still got Madison. I think you removed Terry Ingrid. New technology, fun. <laughs> well, you know, keeps us smiling. It's all good. Okay, Terry. Now you're sideways, but that's okay. And you're on mute. Okay. Okay, um, I'll make a motion to approve item D. Thank you. Second. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Lentz. Aye. Council Member Mackin. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Thanks, everybody. We can get uh, Madison back. There we go. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item seven, old business. F is the capital improvement plan. Staff report, please. Stuart, you're muted. I moved over to the staff report and I didn't unmute myself first. There you go. Madam Mayor, council members, what you have before you tonight is the capital improvement plan that the city adopts every two years or reviews every two years and we go through it and determine which prior projects are our priority projects for the upcoming year. The city staff has worked with the different, with the Parks and Recreation Commission to go through, through the list. Uh, what I have before you is the priority projects. The overall capital improvement plan is you have all the projects that we have on the list the list itself is at the end of the staff report. It is color coded. Those projects that are in yellow have been completed. The ones that are in blue have been approved by the city council previously. The ones that are in bright red are the ones that the staff or the Parks and Recreation Commission consider are, are high priority. The green ones are projects that are new this year that you haven't seen before. Uh, when we, we use purple, when city council asks us to look at a project and revise it from a pre from what you have currently. Uh, what you have for the high priority projects in the utility fund, you have the public works project number 33, lift station condition assessment and hydraulic evaluation. Public works project number 35, the sewer pipeline replacements are priority one projects. Uh, pride, public works project number 61, the water meter um, AMI system. Public Works Project Number 62, the Water Pipeline Replacements, Priority One. Uh, Public Works Project Number 81, which is Preparation of Risk and Resilience Assessment and Emergency Response Plan for Drinking Water. These projects are projects that will be funded out of the bond issue that we have talked about previously. Additionally, high priority projects in public we have are two projects that are paid for by developers. Those are Public, public Works Project Number 88, the Sierra Point Lighting and Landscaping Irrigation Retrofix, FITS and Public Works Project 89, the HET retrofit program. Uh, those are funded through uh, developer payments, which we have already received. And within the general fund, there are a number of priority projects. You have Public Works number 76, Bay Trail rodent removal, Public Works 78, EV charging stations at three locations, Public Works 82, which would provide system maintenance of existing storm drain filters, Public Works 84A, which would be shared use parking light standards. Public Works 91, which is street light meters for Visitation Avenue. Uh, Parks and Recreation number 18, Mission Blue, a preliminary design consultant 
and Parks and Recreation number 24, which is a boiler for the community pool. The city council has allocated uh, $313,000 from the general fund at their mid-year review. There are $361,000 worth of general, general fund projects. What staff, is, what staff would recommend is that we delay approving the boiler for the community pool since that cannot get started until the January or February timeframe when we would normally close the pool for maintenance. What we will do is come back to you in September and October after we've closed, after we know more about how we ended fiscal year 2021 to know if we have that additional $50,000 in either savings or additional revenue to pay for that project. What I'm gonna ask is for Randy to go through the public works projects first and then have Noreen talk about the two uh, parks and recreation priority projects. And then we will be available for any questions that you have on those projects or any projects that are in the list. You know, if I may, uh, before um, Randy goes into the projects, I'm just curious on the bond um, uh, measure, uh, Stuart. So if you could just kind of explain, like, does this go before the voters? And then- no, this, So the, this is going to be a, this is part of our 20 year plan for how we're gonna fund capital projects in the utility, where every five or so years we issue another 20 year bond. We will bring that back to the city council as to what the rate would be for that will cost the vote will cost the rate payers. Uh, that rate would then be subject to a 218 process. The 218 process is where we send a letter out to every property owner and every water user or sewer user in town to let them know what we are doing, what the rate is. Then they would there is a poss there is a potential for a protest at that point. If there is more than 50% protest at that time, we would not be able to impose that rate, and we would need to figure out how how we could pay for those projects differently. Uh, but there will be a process where we bring it to council to let you know what the potential cost of the bond is, what the interest rate we would anticipate receiving. We would uh, send a letter out to all of the users. We would then, after that goes into effect, we would then implement that rate and we would bring back the bond documents back before the city council. So there's plenty of time to have a conversation about the bond issue itself and any of the projects that will be part of it. Okay, yeah, thank you for just explaining that process. Okay. Oh, can I just add something um, just so staff knows when discussing the items? Um, my packet is missing DPW 77 as well as DPW 87 through 91. So I don't have any description of those projects other than what's listed in the table. Um, I don't have information, additional information on those. No, oh, I apologize for that. We will. I don't know if this rest of council is missing those pages, but I'm just missing those pages. So maybe um, if staff, I think some of those are priority items. So staff might want to just go into a little bit more detail because I don't have that information. Council member Davis, have you looked online at the, going through the Brisbane meeting page? Oh, I can pull them up. Do any other council members have the same uh, issue? I, 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 I'm looking at it online and there is that same issue that those pages yeah. are not included. So I will have Randy spend a little bit more time talking about those. I don't believe either one of those projects are ones that we're recommending for funding at this time, nor are they? So I wanna be clear for the public record, what, what is not listed that's being discussed? DPW 77 was not in my packet and then DPW 87 through 91 and three of those are highlighted in red, which I thought was priority. Yes, and right. 87 through 91, so it would only be 91, ma'am. Well, 88, Randy, you need to talk about the zero point lighting and land, lighting and landscape irrigation retrofits, fits, fits the HET retrofit oh, program. Right, and under the developer lighting. projects, right, got you. Okay. Yep. I apologize for that. I thought I had all those included. Excuse me, before we go, Council Member Davis, I heard on A7 and 91, we have that on the, the recording. What else, if anything, is that it? And 77, I think. 77. And 77, thank you. 
All right. So Randy or Stuart, whoever is going to go into these, if you could go into a bit more detail than normal for everybody's benefit who has not seen this. Absolutely, let me go ahead and do that. So let me start with the ones that seem to be missing that are in fact projects we are recommending we go forward with this year. The first one is DPW 88, which is the Sierra Point Landscape and Lighting Irrigation Retrofit Project. This project came out of the water supply assessment that was done for the development, that was done for the EIR for the development at 3500 Marina Boulevard. And one of the things we discovered in there was that there wasn't gonna be enough water for that project. So both this project, uh, DPW 88 and number 89, were ways that we could conserve enough water that we are presently using to make it available for that project. So what's gonna happen with the irrigation retrofits is they're gonna go out and provide what are called these high efficiency nozzle rotors. And what they really do is they're called match precipitation rotors because what they do is rather than putting water out like these the giant roto ones that you're used to seeing maybe on large irrigation farms, they actually put out a amount of water that matches precipitation. So it's more easily absorbed into the ground. And so it's more likely to be used instead of running off. And along with that, there's a, a bunch of irrigation controllers and such. And as Stu notes, that cost of uh, nearly $270,000. We've already received the check for that from the developer. So that's what's going on with that one. The high efficiency toilet retrofit program, as I mentioned earlier, that also came out of the water supply assessment that was part of the EIR. And in this case, what we had done is we went out and staff estimated what the costs were to purchase and to have installed. So we're gonna be able to do a direct install into a citizen's house for up to 200 of these. And again, what we did during the development of the water supply assessment was we were able to estimate how much savings we're gonna garner as a result of this program, which again has been fully funded by the developer and we've already got the check in hand for the tune of nearly $77,000. And, and that provides water for that development. So I'll catch a breath on that. Um, so the last project that I wanna talk about for ones uh, that was not in uh, one or more of this, the uh, council members packets and apparently with, could also not make it to the website. This is DPW 91. This is what I've referred to as Visitation Avenue Convenience Power. This is a real interesting challenge. I know that for a number of years, we've had people saying, we'd like to be able to light the poles on Visitation Avenue. We have those decorative lighting poles and, and it seems like a simple thing. Unfortunately, it's a very complicated thing because the way these light poles were standard, and it's very common for these light standards to be in, is PG&E just designed a project and they created an avenue of providing power to these streetlights, but they do not meter it because PG&E for many years, and including now, has a tariff rate. And the tariff rate is just for streetlights only. And so they pre-calculate what they believe the electricity is gonna be, and we get charged for poles. In order for us to be able to put convenience outlets on these, we have to go in and we have to find those plans. We've still been struggling a little bit with finding these plans from the 70s, because they're pg es plans, we have to extract it from them. We then have to redesign the connection so that we have a meter that pg e can read. And on top of that, these, these were designed uh, with 240 volt power. So, it's, so for us to go back in and create it to 110, we actually need to put a separate neutral wire in there that wasn't in there before. So there's a little bit of a, of a struggle going on. We've got an estimate right now of being able to do that for 50,000, but once we get the, the power source set up so that it can be metered. And once we get the additional wire put in, then we can go in and tap into the poles and put convenience outlets on the pole up at a high enough elevation so that uh, people just can't come by and use them to charge their iPhones, but that staff will be able to go in and install uh, community benefit lighting, Christmas lighting. So that's what that project's about. I'm catching a breath and looking around to see if there are any other questions. So, um. Randy, what is, I, I didn't quite catch what you said the price was of that item. Right now we're estimating at $50,000. And that's to put it on how many poles? I'm sorry, I don't have the number in hand. It's more than two dozen. And we feel that's a priority. Staff had the impression that uh, there were a number of council members that thought it was a priority, ma'am. Right, so the priority for that is um, one of the goals that the council, one of the council subcommittees has talked about is 
providing decorations and lighting decorations during the holiday season along Visitation Avenue. So this past year we did, we put decorations by putting ribbons around the poles. What we would like to do this year is to put holiday lighting on all of the poles. We cannot do that without having uh, the electrical outlet and without, and if to get the electrical outlet, we need the meter. So as far as the other utility projects uh, and the general fund projects, I presume that the council didn't want me to go through all three pages of that spreadsheet. So I, I, am, <laughs> I, think, I see at least one or two of you going, yes, you are so correct, Randy. We really do not want you. But I love all of my children. For me, this is very much the question of uh, which one of your children would you put the mask on first if you are on an airplane? These, these are all my children. I love them all equally. Uh, when they're capital projects, but I'd like to take the opportunity to just ask the council, do you have utility funded projects or do you have the general fund project that you would like me to explain? I know you had the definitions of them in there. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer that, but I don't, at, at, the, uh, at the risk of being generous with your time, I, I don't want to take it all up. I, for one, have no questions on it. We've been down this road before. Many times. <laughs> Thank Colleen, you. maybe um, I need to check my notes here first. Thank you. Madam, I got a quick question. Sure. Randy, on um, the uh, DPW84, um, so it's the shared use parking light standard replacements. Yep. So um, I know we have the SharePoint Lighting and Landscaping District. Mm -hmm. Why isn't that that district, you know, paying that out of their, you know, assessment that we take from them? Uh, well, it, it's a shared, those are shared use lights. So it's not just for SBLL. I think the uh, SBLL lights are typically the lights that are along the roadway out there. Okay. All right. So then. Also uh, sort of customers and others. Got it. Got it. Okay. So d does that, so that district is would not contribute to these types of lighting issues. They have other lighting issues that they do. That's that correct. Yes, there are, correct. Okay. All right, cool, thanks. Um, I'm not sure if I have any other questions for you, Randy. I know there's a lot of, a lot of issues with, with water, right? Sewer and storm and storage and, you know, all, all really important. So, um, it, it sounds like, you know, passing this bond will will allow us that opportunity to, to really tackle these things that we've been kind of hoping don't cause us major problems uh, in the future. Well, well, that's exactly correct, sir. So we've been doing master planning work, what I think of as detailed master planning work as far back as 2003. And we try and do that on a decadal cycle. So we had our most recent update just a, just a handful of years ago. And, and the challenge, of course, we end up with is that when you do a master plan, you always end up with what you have as capacity deficiencies, where, where things are just not as big as they need to be. And then you have actuarial deficiencies. You, you get a pump station that's been in the ground for 50 years, or you get pipes that have been in the ground for 75 years, and you just start to realize that those are eventually going to fail. And, and as you pointed out, we want to capture both of those things before they're a problem, right? Just very much like the Kings Road project we just completed, we wanted to make sure that we had adequate water pressure and service pressure out there, not only for our citizens, but also for our fire flow. And so that North County Fire Authority could go out there and really defend that area if we had a fire. But, and then on the other hand, some of these other projects we're looking at, we're also trying to make sure that we don't have a catastrophic water line break or a sewer line failure and have a real public health issue going on. So I think you've captured it exactly the way we see it. All right, all right. and then. I, I noticed that some of these things seem to be Baylands related. And I guess, uh, you know, cause like, uh, you know, the channel conduit, you know, I guess it's a uh, DPW seven. So it, wouldn't that be kind of Baylands related, you know, and that that'd be part of the development agreement when all this stuff gets kind of laid out. So those projects that are there, that's the reason why we're not proposing them to be funded right now, sir, because yeah. those are identified as to be, paid in future by a future development and that'll happen when they come about. 
So okay. yes, you're correct. There are we do have projects on here that have that have trickled down out of our master planning, but when we know that they are going to be a condition of approval for a development because of the demand they're going to put on the system, we, we just put them in there as a placekeeper so that we all know they're going to have to be done. Okay, and and then just one last question. I'll let other council members ask questions too. Um, the um, and it's a lighting question. It's not. It's not a Department of Public Works, but you know, it's the Crocker Trail lighting. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that um, I know we had the council meeting. I guess a month or so ago, and so that that th those funds for this would come out of that savings of using that different um, uh, material for the trail. Correct. That's exactly correct. That, that's exactly what we're planning on doing. You, you, you are recalling correctly that it was approximately a month ago we came to council and we asked you for a supplemental approach, appropriation because we needed to do a different phase of investigation as part of the environmental documents that we're preparing for that federal funding that we've already obtained for the Crocker Trail. And as, and as you know, the reason we did that is because we had had a little shift in mindset as a result of the Crocker Trail master plan, where we realized that we had a different product we could use on the trail, and we experienced several hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings. And staff's perspective was, we don't want to just give that back to the federal government, because they're just going to give it to somebody else. So let's find a use that we've already kind of identified for there. And we've known that a, that a number of people have suggested, and I know the council received some correspondence this evening, uh, indicating that there ought to be more safety lighting out. And so that's, that's what we're hoping to do. And so we'll see. We'll see what all the studies tell us, what all those phase one study results tell us, if it's feasible for us to do some of the excavation that needs to be done. And then we've got to go through and see, well, how much money are we really saving? And can we do that lighting? It, I don't know that we can do all of it. We certainly hope that we can do most of it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sure. I have a question for legal. Um, because these... Because DPW 77 and uh, 87 through 91 or 88 through 91 um, were not in our packets and also not online, should we move the discussion of that to another meeting and maybe just put it on consent so that the public has access to those documents? That, yeah, I would say that's advisable unless it prejudices the city's interest in any way to wait till the, is it June 17th, I believe, meeting? Uh, I would suggest you do that so the public has access to what was intended. I know it's limited information and we've gotten a lot orally, but it's just best to have the same documents in front of everybody. We'll, we'll bring that back to the June 17th meeting on, on consent. I, those projects will not be, de be delayed for it by two, you know, for the two week. Okay, so just to clarify, uh, DPW 77 and DPW 87 through 91 will now be discussed at the June 17th? It will be put on consent unless anybody pulls them so the record can be posted prior to the June 17 meeting. Great, thank you. Thanks, Madison. Okay, Colleen. Yes, um, I, I have the first question, Randy, if you could. DPW 80 is Modified Urban Water Management Plan. And I, I was wondering why that was not a priority. Because we're not required to do one because of the number of connections we have. Okay, but where it talks about uh, baseline water supply re reliability data, it just seems like that's something we should be concerned about. So, no? It's a yes and a no, ma'am. We've got three pages of items here and we have to come up with a listing of how they're prioritized. And since we're not mandated to have that one, we okay. thought we'd put it off for at least another year. Okay. Then um, another question is, oh, also on that Crocker Trail lighting, are, are those solar lights? We haven't des designed those yet, ma'am. Because the spreadsheet shows uh, on Crocker Trail electrification. Is right. that for the lights? That, that's, well, that's what the spreadsheet showed when the lights were not part of the Crocker Trail funding project that we have right now. So okay. We, so, we, don't, we don't know what it's going to be right now. We're, we're, okay. we're looking to see if we can even 
install them before we try and design them. Okay. Um, there was a DPW 82 about storm drain filter units in the Northeast Ridge. That's not been done yet. Isn't, isn't that something that's already been done in central Brisbane? So the, no, these, so these are particular media type filters that the Regional Water Quality Control Board recommended, pushed us to install when the landmark portion of the Northeast Ridge was being developed. And it's those three locations where these media type based storm drain filters are that we have to go in and maintain. Okay. They're different than just cleaning our regular catch basins. They're actually, there's okay. big bags of material that collect and filter things as they go through. Okay. The DPW84 shared use parking light standard replacements, are they just rusted? Why is that a priority? Because they've rusted and we've got a number of them that have already fallen and had to be replaced uh, and we haven't been able to replace. I mean, fortunately they haven't hit anything as of yet, but we've got off the top of my head, half a dozen of them that have just fallen over when the high winds bother them because they're rusted out at the bottom. So this is not cosmetic, this is a safety issue. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The Marina 3 rebuild dumpster recycling enclosures, since it, that seems like a, a, a health issue, why is that not a priority at $56,000? Again, we just don't think we just don't think that we're at the point yet that it needs to be done, ma'am. We can get by. There, okay. there are always things that we could put on. I mean, I, the reality is that if the council asked me, are all these priorities? Would I like to get them all done? I'd say yes, but we sure. get to a point where we are fiscally constrained, and so we we try to be responsible and give you our best recommendations. But we're happy to move projects around as council sees fit. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Nothing. I, I have a question when we get to the um, park and rec request, but not on this one. Okay. Okay. If there's no more questions, can we move on to park and rec? Noreen. Thank you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. So the, the two projects that have risen to the top from the parks and recreation perspective, uh, the first being PR 18, which is preliminary design for facility upgrades at the Mission Blue Center. Um, this project would allow for the city to hire a consultant to come in and analyze the proposed upgrades for the Mission Blue Center. There's been a significant amount of input from residents, nonprofit groups, commissioners, um, renters, over the last couple of years regarding requests for facility renovations and upgrades, um, things that include uh, replacement of the restroom countertops, renovations to the kitchen to possibly convert it to a licensed commercial kitchen, which opens up the opportunities for the facility in the future, um, replacement of rotten exterior beams and landscaping improvements. So uh, the what we would be looking for the consultant to do is to come in and make a professional recommendation with a preliminary design as well as an, a cost estimate for that scope of work. And um, that would just allow for overall safer community events and gatherings in the facility could increase the potential for more rental revenue in the future and allow for ex expanded community programming. The second being a replacement of the boiler at the community pool. And this is a, a staff priority. So funding for this project would replace the old original, it's original to the pool, so uh, it's quite old, uh, with a more efficient and reliable boiler. Uh, the current boiler has surpassed uh, the typical lifespan of a unit, uh, similar to the one that we have. And we have performed quite a substantial repairs on the unit over the last several years, and every time it's in the thousands of dollars range. So um, it's becoming increasingly more expensive to maintain it. Um, we've also, over the last couple of years, not so much in 2020, but in 2019, had several incidents where we had to close the pool due to boiler um, failures and um, necessary emergency maintenance on the boiler. So um, we are hoping that um, within the next year or so that we would 
have the ability to replace the boiler uh, with a more efficient and reliable one so that it doesn't impact our operations at the pool. Okay, questions for Noreen. Terry. So on the Mission Blue um, kitchen and maintenance, um, I totally agree that we should um, keep the Mission Blue Center in good shape and what is necessary to be done. I think that if it's being considered to be converted to a commercial kitchen, that brings an amazing amount of cost because I've seen what those can cost. I don't know there. Um, but it also brings in a lot of health standards that need to be maintained and I think would be a bad move. I think making it a more usable kitchen is one thing. I think going to a commercial kitchen standard would be impossible for the city to manage. Um, it, it brings so much to the table when you do a commercial kitchen um, and the space and then is very difficult for that. So um, I'm not sure that looking at commercial kitchen, I think we've sort of discussed this in the past. Um, I don't think we ever got a bid because it is so cost prohibitive, but um, I, I certainly agree that we should look and see what maintenance needs to be done, but I would be against making that a commercial kitchen. Um, it might be worth it to talk to Colma because they have like a beautiful um, community center and they have a really big kitchen. I don't know if it's technically a commercial kitchen, but like I can't imagine having a wedding at Mission Blue with that kitchen. There's just no way. I mean, I, I even know that in some events like um, – it's been hard to even boil a pot of water on that stove. And I think there have been enhancements maybe already to the, to the kitchen in the meantime, but at some point, you know, when you have a large scale event and you have all these people coming in and out of the kitchen, I think the, the footprint of the kitchen needs to be expanded. Um, but I think that the kitchen really limits any kind of, um, you know, event that someone would be willing to pay good money to have if, a kitchen was, you know, food was a, a, a central part to that. The other problem is like that fridge, that fridge is way too small. And I think that a lot of times, um, or the, in the fridge before it's, it's because it's a regular fridge for a house. Like uh, sometimes the, the shelves come out and they get misplaced and then you like have nowhere to put the, your food. So I do, I, I personally think that the footprint needs to be expanded and the appliances need to be expanded so that, you know, that Mission Blue can accommodate events. Um, it, it's a big space. So it's, naturally it should be able to accommodate a wedding or accommodate a gala. Um, but I do feel like that kitchen, it always presents like a challenge to whoever's there. So I think that we could make some of that money back by doing those improvements. I'm unfamiliar with all the things that come along with a commercial kitchen. That's like totally Terry's domain. And um, if she says that, I believe it. So it, it just, it might be just worth talking to Colma and see what they do. Cause they've got a really great kitchen. And, um, but either way, even if we keep it with, if we don't, if it's not technically commercial, I think it, it does need to be bigger. Pauline? Noreen, could you tell me what's the consideration of the outdoor landscaping improvements? What's going on there? Um, we've received feedback from past renters and some of the nonprofit groups that utilize the building more regularly that um, the landscaping needs some upgrades and some attention. Is there going to be consideration of our, our ongoing water shortages in redesigning that landscaping? I, w I would assume so. I think that the city has identified it as a priority to utilize, you know, native native plant species and and those that are a little bit more drought tolerant. 
Okay, and the projected cost at 45,000 is for the consultant. That's and correct. It sounds like the consultant is to redesign the kitchen and the restrooms because the rest in here, these are repairs. Is that That's correct? correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let's Um, thanks, Noreen. So I, I just want to get a little bit more clarification on the consultant. So we would hire that consultant to really kind of give a, a uh, you know, to give their perspective on what would be needed to upgrade Mission Blue to make it more current, to make it more attractive to people who are looking for facilities such as ours, correct? Yes. All right. And, you know, I think anybody that that's been to Mission Blue, I mean, we all love it. But we also know that it's in need of an upgrade. And that kitchen, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, that thing is teeny tiny. I mean, that that's like, you know, a, a one bedroom apartment type kitchen. You know, that's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not for a facility like that. And um I would, I mean, I, I appreciate your opinion, uh, Terry, about the commercial kitchen, but I, I think we need to have a consultant give us an evaluation and, and, and look at other similar properties and see if that makes sense. Uh, because I, I, I think having a, an upgraded commercial kitchen, if you're going to have a first rate uh, facility, you need to have a first rate kitchen. So, so, so I'm just going to chime in a little bit on that. Just an ancillary system for a stove hood is going to run about eighty thousand dollars, just for the hood on a stove for a commercial kitchen, um, and then it gets into all the cleaning and the maintenance that needs to be done to create a commercial kitchen. And right now, I appreciate um, you know the uh, I've worked in that kitchen before, and you really can't cook anything in it, and the refrigerator doesn't have shelves. Um, most of the time there's not even dish soap. So <laughs> yes, I think updates need to be done, but I don't think that unless we get a, um, a scheme together to rent it out for $5,000, like a commercial kitchen wedding venue can cost someone, um, to be doing, you know, a, quarter of a million dollar kitchen update is could be really cost prohibitive and I would hate to be using money just to say oh yes we could put in fancy sinks and fancy this and that and still not have it be useful Absolutely. I mean I think, I think yeah. we need to do an update and keep our you know the facility with rotting boards of course but I wouldn't think a consultant would be needed to look at that to give us what needs to be done on that, but I could be wrong. So that's just Gary, my two cents. Is the Yacht Club, the Yacht Club kitchen is considered a commercial kitchen, right? It is not, it, it is not a licensed commercial kitchen for doing outside commercial work. So I think that maybe like commercial is what we're getting hung up on because I, I see like the Yacht Club, right? There's the huge stove. Like that stove and that oven is built for events, for events. Um, right. And so, and that, that a uh, sink with a big, it's got like a big mm -hmm. nozzle, you know, that's really designed. And so maybe like commercial is what we're getting hung up on. But I think that like a, a, a utilitarian, kitchen a, a kitchen that it can accommodate appliances of the size that are required for um events that fit in the space of mission blue it's not compatible right it's like an event space with a one but like that kitchen's like the size of my kitchen my house in my studio so we just need to like bring it so that these things are in, are are compatible but maybe like ex maybe using the term commercial is getting us way way further than where like what we actually need to be yeah, yeah you know I, that makes sense right yeah you know see I, i'm surprised that the yacht club is not a commercial kitchen because that seems well uh, we're getting into semantics right? we're getting yeah. into semantics there 
but you know it's not really designated as a commercial kitchen. Right. Okay. And if you think about the one at Mission Blue, it's smaller than the one at Mission Blue is smaller than the one we have in the community center. Yeah. Well, that room, that room is so small. That kitchen room itself is so small. Can we knock out that wall and move it over and, and just get, you know, general contractor in to do that rather than a $45,000 consultant who's going to say, your kitchen's too small. Um, and then we've got to do that anyway. Um, it, could, and, and, you know, as Madison said, can we go look at a couple of these other uh, community centers that have got workable kitchens that, you know, rather than spending money on a commercial kitchen, which is horrendously expensive, but we could do upgrades with the big sinks and a, a decent uh, big oven and that, but I, I know how little that room is and we're not going to fit any of that in there. For me, we'd have to take over some of the space of the room next door. Can we, right. can we look at that a little differently maybe, the whole mm. thing? Yeah, absolutely. And, and part of the justification in hiring a consultant to look at the space is to determine whether or not we can absorb those adjacent closet spaces into the kitchen to be able to expand the kitchen footprint. But we recognize that that might require some structural changes to the building and we would want to make sure that we have a professional examine that before we made those decisions. Couldn't, couldn't we just get some of our well known local contractors to come up and look at it? They're not going to charge forty-five thousand dollars to come and say, "Hey, you know, it's it's easy enough to move the wall over four feet. It's going to cost you twenty thousand dollars or forty-five thousand dollars to do the work, and we didn't need to hire someone to tell us that that's what we could do." That's my concern. Is what 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 are we spending the forty-five thousand dollars on to to get an opinion that I could probably walk in tomorrow and tell you what we could do because I've done so much construction myself. You know what I mean? That's that's my only concern is that we're but, spending forty thousand dollars. I don't think we need to. Right. Noreen, would they also be providing us the plans in order to do the work as well? Yes. So that's that, important. That's, that's really that important. that is what we. I mean, the forty-five thousand dollars is not just to say that what we can do, but also to provide us the architectural plans and the engineering plans to make it work for us. All right. Okay. We want well, the kitchen to be designed by somebody who understands events and how those kitchens flow. We don't want a, someone who's used to making residential kitchens because that's the problem we have right now to come and redesign a bigger kitchen that might just perpetuate the same problems like if we're gonna try to fix the problem then we just need to do it right uh, well <laughs> and, there, and there's other things besides the kitchen too that they would well, work on well one of one of the things in this description of this um, would be provide a preliminary design and cost estimate it doesn't say anything about plans or drawings or architectural renderings, um, you know, or, or that kind of thing. So uh, anyway. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, and then uh, Noreen, on the, um, some of the, the, the school related projects, you know, so the, the school passed the bond. Um, I don't know if that bond could then be applied to other areas that are not the buildings on the school property but could could they use some of those bond um the bond revenue for some of these uh, uh, like field improvements and bathroom um i'm not sure how the bond uh financing would work in reference to city properties versus district properties well i mean all these are i think district properties i i think that would be better answered by ronan yeah. and we can we can pose that question to ronan at a later date Okay, cool. And then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking through here and I can't find it, but it was, you know, I read something about the um, expanding the, um, the community garden. And um, I, I know that, that do we, we have a fairly long list of people that want to get into the community garden, correct? That's my understanding. Oh, okay. So, um, I mean, that seems like that, 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 that would be a, a, a priority. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not finding it in my notes here, but um, what, what was the price tag on, on that? That is under the city council project number three, and that would be about $67,000. Okay, 67 k okay. okay, so, and then um, that is, I'm assuming that's just white, Stuart? 
Correct. Okay. Um, okay, 67K. All right. And, and then it, it's one last thing, Maureen. I mean, Maureen, the, uh, the marquee sign, um, I guess the if we did hire someone, they, they, they'd probably weigh in on that as well. If, if it would make sense to, to, to do that and, and um, upgrade the property. You mean the marquee sign for Mission Blue? Yes. So the commission kind of did away with that uh, when we prioritized the digital e-ink signboards um, in the city and having the cap additional capability of the e-ink signboard at the corner there of Monarch and Mission Blue Drive. So it's, I don't believe it's still on the list or it might not be. Um, okay, so then we should just get rid, because it, yeah, it was the PR6. So I guess we should just take that off the list. Yep. Not see it anymore. Okay, cool. so So could I follow up on that? Um, the, the sign board that we budgeted for a year and a half ago, what's ever happened with that? Um, they are in progress. So we have a meeting next week with the installer and we're looking for, we're looking forward to installation later this month. Great. Thank you. So for the community garden expansion, how many plots do you get with that expansion? Um, I, I do not know. I do not know the number that we would actually get for that. That was, we would have to take a look at the number of plots. It would be expanding it up north, up, 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 up on the hill. And at the moment, we don't, have, we don't have down an below. estimate of the number of plots. Because it would be interesting to know, like, oh, we're going to spend 60000 67000 and get five more plots, you know? Like, it would, I think that would help put it into perspective, like, the cost versus what you're getting. What we can do is we could bring that back at, a, at the later date when we have finished determining what is available from fiscal year 2021. When we bring back the boiler, we can bring back more information on that project. Uh, along with how many people are on the list waiting for plots. So it was something to compare it to. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Anything else? So what we would be asking of you tonight is to, is to approve the projects um, uh, that are the party projects for the city um, not including, I have to get back to the point on my staff report, not including project um, nine, public works 82, 84 and 91 at this point. We will bring those back in 88 and 89. No, 88, 89, 91. We will bring those three back to you at the next council meeting to be under consent calendar. And then we will bring back project number PR24 and CC03 after we have a better understanding of how we ended the fiscal year. I will make that motion. Second. Roll call vote, please. Oh, do we need to have public comment on this? Sorry. Um, yeah, Council um, Mayor Cunningham, I did want to note that we received public comment from Dana Dilworth. Was that the only letter clerk for D? I thought there was a second. Was it just the one? Just one particularly for this item. We have Thank another you. one from Ms. Dilworth for another oh, item. Thank you. And there's nobody else who wishes to make a comment on what we've been talking about. Uh, I see a raised hand from Kim Folian, Madam Mayor. Okay. Go ahead, Kim. Hi, I just had a question on the rodent removal out at uh, uh, the marina. Yeah. What does that entail? Are you, are you talking in general or do, is there something specific, Kim? I mean, um, there... it was, I think it's one of the priorities. And so I wanted to know what does that mean? How are they going to be removed? Stuart? Randy, that is that's DPW 76. I will 
I, I, I just I just picture a Bill Murray kind of idea, but no, I know I that's not going to say what anything. Is. I was just going to let Stu have the deer in the headlight. Nope, I, I just see Bill Murray, so I'm going to let you do that, Randy. So that would be a two-phase process. The first one would be to use an inert rodenticide that's been approved by the EPA, and if that is not successful, then the next phase would be to go to traffic. I'm sorry, what's the first one? I couldn't hear. A, a U.S. EPA approved rodenticide. It's an, it's an inert gas that's placed into the burrows. How humane is that? I, that's my concern. I, I'm not, I understand why they need to be removed, but just in general, poisons are just, they suffer. And I just, it's just heartbreaking to me. I, I, I would hope there's something quick, more humane. This that's tends to be a very quick process. It, it's a gas. <laughs> Okay. It's, it's, it's fast acting. It's not, it's, it doesn't cause them to bleed or anything. Okay. Like that. It's very fast acting. Okay. Thank you, Randy. That, that was all I had. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Ingrid, anybody else have any comments? So I'll go back and make that approval. I need a second. 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 Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we are now moving on to item G to consider the approval of the final Crocker Trail Master Plan. Staff report, please. All right, good evening again. Um, the draft plan for the Crocker Trail Master Plan came before the council in March, and the consultant team has since incorporated your feedback and input. The plan before you this evening incorporates the city's desired trail features and project objectives, which include connectivity, environmental preservation, art, recreation, and safety. To evoke the vision and character of key areas along the trail, the consultant has prepared character perspective sketches and imagery for your review. Uh, an opinion of probable costs and grant funding overlay has been provided as part of the final master plan. It should be noted that funding for implementation beyond the trail resurfacing is not allocated at this time. Uh, with the approval of the master plan, city staff will be able to pursue alternative funding sources and grant opportunities to support future implementation. At this time, the council is being asked to receive and approve the final master plan for Crocker Trail. And with that, I will turn it over to Kayla Shabelsky and Mike Sherrod from RRM Design Group to present the plan and uh, happy to answer any additional questions that you may have. Thanks, Lauren. Noreen. Thank you, Honorable Mayor Cunningham and council members. We're here today, as you mentioned, to bring an update present the final Crocker Park Trail Master Plan. All right. So some of this will be an overview uh, that we discussed last time. I will uh, keep it shorter since you've heard this once before, but wanted to still uh, go through this for uh, any community members who may have missed the last presentation. Uh, project process kicking off at the beginning with the stakeholders and community up front to really establish what are the goals and the visions for this project. Um, throughout the process, we had additional community meetings, worked with the technical advisory committee, uh, public works, uh, and brought this back to the technical advisory committee, city council and parks and rec. Uh, so I just went through a little bit of this, but we had uh, participants from uh, various stakeholder groups within the city. There was also surveys out to local businesses and a lot of uh, lively community input throughout the process. So in the attachments that you have and in the master plan, uh, we're showing the trail split into various layers so that you can understand. Uh, these graphics will look a lot larger on here for the icons that remember that resemble uh, various amenities that could occur in these potential uh, locations. There was a strong desire for the active improvements in the corridor. Uh, one of the more recent features that has gained a lot of traction 
and desire is the inclusion of some skills, training amenities along the trail. Uh, we also, the inclusion of fitness stations and some nature play. Uh, you'll see in the packet, the graphics uh, resembling what some of these could begin to look like. We aren't at, at this time picking out any, any of these amenities. This is just to envision the character within the trail. So looking at how these can be multi-use uh, within the space that the city owns. And the contemplative rest areas starting to look at ways to enhance the corridor. Uh, there's a very strong desire to green the corridor uh, through various methods of removing non-native species and um, starting to implement restoration throughout the corridor and, and looking at ways that the community can enjoy those uh, those amenities, those upgrades, whether it be um, educational, for example, uh, the location off of Cypress Lane where there is the uh, chorus frogs currently um, in that particular area, uh, considering ways to maintain the, the natural drainage in the area possibly, uh, including a boardwalk in that location and having the educational signage there. You also see some images here based on surveys, surveys from community feedback. There was a very strong desire to have a, a natural style and feel to the amenities and furnishings that are included throughout the corridor. Uh, looking at the trail, uh, for a majority of the trail, the city property is a 20 foot wide uh, section. Uh, this was the former rail right away. Uh, there are some areas where the, the city owns adjacent slopes, but uh, acknowledging that in, in certain locations uh, where there are invasive species, uh, the city may not, may not own the adjacent property. So um, seeing what amenities can fit within the space and coexist together. Uh, also, the opportunities uh, that are out there for art to be incorporated in the future and to be uh, examined further, whether it be temporary or permanent or performing arts uh, and possibly even the public private art partnerships. Uh, and those have been recorded based on surveys that were sent to local businesses of those uh, businesses who are interested to hear more at a further date. Access and safety was a big, um, a big trend that we heard wanting to have the desire for lighting. So this plan is acknowledging the city's desire, uh, the city, um, sorry, the community members desire for lighting within the corridor uh, to increase safety. Uh, there was a desire to have a combination of overhead uh, and bollard lighting uh, that would need to be analyzed further through the environmental process to determine uh, the feasibility uh, this plan is just acknowledging that and making sure that people understand when they access the trail, having trail maps so that they understand how far it is to certain distances uh, before the next safe exit would occur. And other natural ways to prevent non-authorized vehicles from accessing the trail through uh, low, low fencing or boulders. Looking at trailhead improvements, increasing parking there at the trailhead across from the dog park on Park Lane. And the roadway crossing safety enhancements. Uh, we went through these at the last presentation. Uh, they were developed working with the traffic engineer and public works based on the, um, the recommendations. That's what's shown here in these graphics. The one with the warranting the most improvements would be the location at South Hill Drive the junction of the Cory Trail and the Crocker Park Trail, right there where the, the Cory uh, trucks enter and exit. Uh, other improvements throughout include rapid flashing beacons to warn uh, drivers of on, you know, oncoming traffic of the crossings. Approaching 
uh, Monarch Drive. There's two different viable options here that the city is going to explore further. Signage at Cypress Lane and then widening the corral for accessibility at Valley Drive to increase the interior spaces further. So that's the update from today. Also in your handout package, as Noreen mentioned, since the last meeting, uh, we have included uh, potential funding sources for the city to consider and also a preliminary opinion of probable cost. Uh, I do wanna note in the cost that the number in there does include um, the resurfacing that is going to be occurring. So that was not deducted from the total that's shown there. We're happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you so much. Colleen, go ahead. Well, on the uh, staff report, fiscal impact, and it says funding for implementation beyond trail resurfacing is not allocated. I'd like to know what you mean by that. It means that uh, for any of the amenities or vision or plan that's presented within the master plan, we don't have existing funding to allocate towards those things outside of the resurfacing of the trail itself. So um, staff would need to seek and uh, pursue alternative funding sources, whether it be through grants um, or other opportunities that are out there to fund these improvements that are presented within the master plan. And so if grants are not obtainable, are the items that are the, I'll just call them the extras, going to be brought back for approval by the council? They would have to be. So what they would do is they would be included in future capital improvement plans that we would bring to you. And so that way you would see all of the different costs for each of them. And you know, as we go through the capital improvement plan, as we have money available, from the, you know, if we have money available in the general fund or if we find other money available to do them, we would let council know and we would, let, you know, as we do with all of our capital improvements. So approval of this plan would mean that anything that you could find grants would go forward automatically. Anything where there was no funding or required city funding would come back to the council? It, we would bring any grant back to the city council before we went forward with it. Okay, second question. Um, on one of the presentation slides noted as active areas, there's been a lot of community feedback about the skills training amenities, bike ramps, and on that particular slide, do you, can you bring that up, active areas, please? Okay, so there's one circle there shown. Euphemistically, we'll say it's below the ridge. Is that the only location for skills training or is it cited throughout the whole complex? We have shown here uh, various locations with that symbol. So there's the one below vision. The yeah, can you see my mouse or no? Yes. Okay, oh, sorry. There's one here below Mission Blue, one closer to North Hill Drive, uh, in between South Hill and Park Lane here, uh, continuing along after South Hill. And then as you wrap around in the back uh, before you get back to West Hill Drive oh. here. Here's a concern I have, the one below the Ridge properties. There was a bakery that was denied a planning commission approval because of the potential for noise. There's been ongoing complaints from people on the Ridge, they can't sleep or it's just constant noise because we are a parabolic bowl, the noise goes right up the hill. That one location under the ridge, I think you've got a noise problem there. 
It's going to be a popular thing if implemented, and I would strongly suggest you consider a different site. I don't think that had come up maybe in all of your meetings because there may be a lot of residents who are unaware of the noise problems in affecting the, the people up on the ridge. And the locations in this plan, you know, the, the city is not tied to these exact locations. This is a, an opportunity location and, um, you know, with the additional information uh, that, that potentially could be removed or relocated. I think that's something I'd strongly, strongly suggest you look into. Thank you. Okay, other questions for Kelly? Um, actually, I don't have a question. I have more of a discussion issue, so okay. I'll wait. Okay, I have a question. questions before we go into discussion? I have, question. I have one question, Madam Mayor. Uh, so Kayla, and I, and I, and, you know, you, you said it, you know, but I just want to, I just want to be really, really clear about like what you said, just so I understand it and, and community understands it, that um, what's before us in this master plan is really just kind of a, a, a 30,000 foot, maybe not 30,000, maybe, maybe 15,000 foot kind of view of this area here are some potential suggestions that you might want to consider, but, but really it's just like, you know, creating that plan so that then if there were future opportunities for grants and things like that, we have something to be able to, to go out and, and, and receive that money as well as, you know, for future um, uh, capital improvements, we, we, we have kind of a base to kind of, of, you know, look at and see what makes sense for our community. Is it, it, am I getting that right? Am I missing something there? Yes, correct. I think I will defer to Mike on this one if you're here. Yeah, I've got it. Um, yeah, Cliff, that's a good question. And the, the purpose of this playing effort was to engage the community and work through a community driven design process to understand what the community wanted to see for the use of this roughly 20 foot quarter that the city controls to uh, try and incorporate as much as we could. Obviously everything doesn't fit. So going through that process, what the master plan shows is the, 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 the preferred uses and the general locations where those would occur. Later, they would be subject to environmental review. So for example, the noise that would be analyzed as well that will help determine and define what actually can go into the space and where it's best to be located. And then subsequent to that would be a design phase, which actually designs the space where you would have input and see with specificity where items would be located and which, and which would be contained in the project. Got it, got it. And then approval of the master plan doesn't mean that, okay, yeah, we're gonna do this particular use uh, along the, the corridor is this we're approving this plan that so that eventually we might do something and it could be a or it could be b or it could be c correct sure. okay thank you i have a question uh-huh go ahead so um we've had obviously a lot of written correspondences over the last few days regarding support for a pump track so would that be considered 59 on the budget appendix D skills training or is that something separate? The skills training listed on there that would be the locations I just pointed out on the map in the active areas. So the inclusion of the pump track um, we've noted is a potential opportunity that could occur in the upper Crocker Park area. Um, if that least least property um, is available for further development, so that would be additional funds and costs that's not listed. So we could um, add the pump track cost as an alternative in the back of the document and update is, that figure. So that's not part of the twenty four thousand dollar 
Because I think a lot of, I think the public thinks that we're like, we're going to be deciding whether we're approving a pump track right now. And I think that that's inaccurate. I think that some of the public has been maybe misled about what we're actually doing tonight. Um, almost kind of like Parkside, right? Like we envisioned what Parkside could be, but us going through that process wasn't saying like, we're, we're going to get out our hammers and our wood and we're going to get to going on it tomorrow. So um, I just wanted to clarify that, that, you know, these things are all just things that we have assessed the possibilities of, but it sounds like the pump track specifically is not even part of that budget and therefore is not something that we can even really discuss because we don't know what the financial impacts of that would be. And that's not really before us right now. So I just want to make sure that I'm understanding that correctly and the public is understanding that correctly because I think there might be some disappointment out there in the community if you know, that's really not what's before us at this moment, that the community may think that we're disregarding what their desire is for this space, but it's just not, that's just not what's before us at this very moment. It's not to say that's not something that we can't look at as we want to start enhancing this area, but I just want to make sure that I'm on the right track in all of what I'm saying right now. Yes, so maybe the the best approach would be to update the opinion of probable cost to include um, you know, some of those costs for the different alternatives that could occur in that upper Crocker Park area. And that would be the, the best solution because uh, we do list what different amenities can occur back there, but since um, we haven't been, you know, the decisions haven't been made, those costs aren't listed. Um, so adding those as alternatives may be the best approach. So you have the figures there to look at. If I, if I may jump in, so Kayla, uh, I mean, there are different types of pump tracks, right? There are pump tracks that are made out of dirt and there's some that are made out of wood or, or you know, like recycled, you know, plastic bottles. I mean, uh, and, and, and how big they are and, you know, what kind of tricks, you, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's, there's all kinds of variances, you know, in, in, in what, where the cost would be. Um, so, I mean, how would you then assess, like, would you like give, give a range, say, Hey, okay. Yeah. If you did like kind of a down and dirty dirt thing, okay, here's this. And then if you went kind of more higher end and hired a consultant and did all this work, here's what the cost would be for that. Kayla, I can jump in there. What we generally, the pump tracks that, that are generally built are either just so, stabilized soil or if you want to do it more permanently out of a asphalt or concrete. We work with uh, designers who specialize, specialize in that. We can get a range and we can put a budget range in there. So you have something of a, of a budgetary range to look at as you're beginning to, if, if that's the direction the city chooses to go, you have a range of costs associated with material selection. And again, the, the design would happen subsequent to this process of what yes. it's going to look like, how big it is, the footprint, whether or not it has supporting elements that might need to go along with that other infrastructure, that would get figured out later on in the, in the design process. But we could put a budgetary placeholder in the form of a, of a price range to provide some sort of a guide, guiding document for what you, what the city might want to budget. Got it. Okay. No, thank, thank, thank you for that. I mean, it, there's, it, you know, I've been getting that feedback, just like my other fellow council members, you know, there seems to be a strong desire for a pump track. Um, I've gone out and looked at some pump tracks and, and th there's, there's lots of different options out there. You know, what makes sense for the, that site in the northern part of the of the trail system you know i guess that 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 should be part of the public process right and, and a standalone project that kind of like the skate park i, I think of it kind of similar where okay here's this here's this piece of property that the city owns what should we do with it here are some ideas and then and then kind of go with the one that um i guess gets the most community support Noreen, I have a question for you. Um, when you did these community um, workshops relative to the 
uh, trail <coughs> master plan. Did, did pump track come up at all? Or is this just something that, you know, people, you know, sending it, we've got tons of letters of support for a pump track. So obviously there's a, a group of people who are rallying for this. Did you hear that in, in the public? Meetings. We did, yes. Um, we did hear feedback. I think uh, it, it gained a little bit more momentum towards the tail end of the process, but at various points throughout the community engagement, we did hear um, from residents expressing an interest. Okay, so we throw it in the interest pile, and you know we're we're just approving a plan for the future, and and I'm I'm assuming now it'll be okay. Where do we get money to do what? And then what becomes the priority within this project, correct? That's correct. Okay. So, so really we're just saying, hey, we've got this, this plan. Now we figure out where to plug and play things. That, would that be, not that I've ever done a master plan for a space like this, but okay. Thank you. Carrie, Colleen, anyone other questions on this? No questions, just discussion. Okay. There's Madam Mayor, would you like me to note all the public comment that has been? Sure, and if there's public comment, maybe we hear the public comment and then we just go into discussion after that. So if there's anyone who wants to speak, let us. Um, I, did I did want to note that we did receive 13 correspondences regarding the support for bicycle pump track and bicycle skills features and um, Dana Dilworth also made the request for me to read her, her public comments. Um, and this is for city council staff and the public. What a wonderful opportunity to explore the possibilities of improving our rails to trails gem endless potential. Have you done a complete enough environmental assessment to have truly explore, explored its full potential? Lacking in the executive summary is the recognition that Crocker Industrial Park was once a marsh. It is the watershed of the eastern flank of San Bruno Mountain. It's adjacent to California State Envi Environmental Preserves of Owl and Buckeye Canyons. It, it, its wetlands serve a greater population than runners, bikers, workers, taking breaks, and strollers. It also possesses greater than 0 0.08 acres of wetland and even greater wetland potential when viewed with a habitat enhancement perspective. Please get a second opinion. Find someone other than WRA Environmental to do your wetlands assessment. There's no mention of necessary upland habitation protection. Sweep setback ordinances as required by California Water Resources Control Board. Just a few myopic linear feet of persistent wetlands. Um, viewed in July once again off season after a dry wet winter when most have dried up. Certainly missed the spring frog chorus. Did you do any rare and endangered species assessment? Did you assess any threatened or enlisted plants? The general rule of riparian areas out of San Bruno Mountain may be habitat for the San Francisco garter snake, California red-legged frog, and a multitude of listed plants. Get a second opinion from someone who knows the mountain. Conduct your surveys in January or February. Better yet, ask for photos and documentation from residents that protected those wetlands in the past, rather than keep paying taxpayer dollars for incompetent environmental assessments conducted in the wrong season. I can't believe that dozens of citizens toiled in invasive weed removal. Year after year, bought backhoes in to clear out the choke channels properly, instructed Public Works Department how to create zigzag swales to slow down the water coming off the mountain, to have only protected 0.08 acres of wetlands. That's all that's left out of 264 acres. The stated objective is to design a park. Where is a topographic map to see the elevation from West Hill to Bayshore to properly place wetlands and other features? What was Mountain Watch input? Where's the discussion of the more glaring issue mentioned only in passing as the corridor contains undesirable invasive and non-native plants? The dead trees are a hazard and the underbrush are major fire load. You must clear the dead trees and underbrush first immediately. If a complete whacking and fire protection clearing isn't proposed as is required of homeowners to create defensible spaces and the ABAC grant is a waste money and citizens reserve the right to challenge the grant at state level. Phasing the plan is mentioned, but it should be correct environmental conditions first, adding another layer of crystalline ground dust in an area that might be poisoned with industrial chemicals. Then later studied environment is not appropriate phasing or appropriate use of our taxpayer dollars. We have waited 30 years since we last worked out our general plan to have no mention 
uh, to have no movement forward on wetlands anywhere. No studies, no true plan in spite of state laws requiring municipalities to be ecologically sensitive around wetlands and the set standards for their protection. During reconnaissance for this plan, it was noticed that the city was, the city has undergrounded a wonderfully, wonderful formerly natural wetland area near the turnaround on Cypress Lane. You missed that wetland because it has been extirpated without environmental review. We had cleared invasive weeds, created two ponds, one deep, one shallow, and fostered swallowtail butterfly larva above, and a San Francisco forktail damselfly larva below, gone. An engineer solution to an infrequent environmental problem. Please describe in detail what the city lease on property in South Hill means as identified on the opportunity and constraints map. Are there other similar issues if we, if we were to include connections to West Hills Place public access and San, Fran San Bruno Mountain County Park, which should be included? Where's the vision? Also, there's no mention of the fact that the Clary Road has areas about to collapse due to hillside failure. Not noticed or mentioned, no slurry seal in the budget. I don't think another layer of abrasive dust and existing functional trail bed is more important than correcting the potential loss of our beloved Clary Road. I am livid that the sale of our public open space has resulted in only potential environmental enhancements. Sales that allow more traffic, more fuel use, more sound and more light impacts to the environment, but not one speck of environmental enhancements. Running, relaxing and educational uses documented in overlays, but not one lick of environmental enhancements required or guaranteed. Potential wetlands nonsense, they are wetlands persisted. They have been here the entire 32 years that have lived here. I imagine that they have been here since San Bruno Mountain lifted Guadalupe out of the bay. Your assessments and conclusions are not acceptable, not correct, and violates CEQA, particularly if you tend to study impacts after the fact. This is an incomplete plan and the weeks of incompetence if you prove it in its current form as a justification for your million dollar gravel, pro gravel project, I'll contact ABAG personally and protest your incompetence. A number of citizens from the environmental community have told me they have made comments, even wrote pages of comments, and did not think they had been heard. They never got notices for the second and third meetings and felt overrun by the runner imbalanced public process. Things we had we find missing are the educational opportunities for wetlands and the consideration of the relocation of the Mission Blue Nursery. The best locations are the seating area proposed at the Clary Crocker Trail location, as well as the entire flat area, which is already a seasonal wetland habitat on Mission Blue and South Hill. Our other items to consider priorities to the crushed rock resurfac resurfacing project are speed enforcement of speeding trucks, lighting the, tra the trail is creepy, pedestrian corral on Valley Drive, is counterintuitive, perhaps the landscape median should be considered. Wayfinding points should show the entire trail map and perhaps a color or design reference to flag connection. They like Guadalupe along the north northern boundary from South Hill to Cypress Lane, better yet the tunnel. While I am an artist and would love to see art along there, we need more than a few trees. The hillside represents an opportunity for community cleanups of the invasive weeds. It was supposed to be restored habitat. After that, you can resurface the trail if necessary. Thank you for the opportunity for the community to advocate for the environment. I and many others look forward to your response. And then we also have a raised hand from Kim Folian. Hey, Kim. Hello, Madam Mayor. This is actually Michael Barnes using Kim Foline's computer. Um, first, I'd like to say that the master scale master plan process designed. Michael, you're breaking up. Well, all I can do is is speak louder because I'm pretty close to the computer. Okay, that sounds better. So the trail master plan process was designed to engage and solicit public input so that the plan would meet the needs of the community. You asked for public input and the public is telling you what they want. The public is not misled, it is participating. Respect the public's input. So I've attended all the meetings on this topic and at the very first community meeting, the pump track was mentioned. From the very first meeting until now, the pump track has been part of every community discussion about the trail master plan. As far as the master plan goes, I like the trail mile markers. I like the trail surface. I like the exercise stations, the seating, and the elevated walkway around the seasonal marsh. I support removing pompous grass and planting native plants. It is also important that we provide our children with active recreational opportunities. This is why a pump track on the Upper Crocker Trail is vital. It will further encourage active and healthy outdoor trail use 
And conveniently, there are already 124 striped free public parking spaces surrounding this location. Add a porta potty like the one we've had at the tennis court for years, and a pump track is feasible, particularly if it is made from durable materials like asphalt. Please put the pump track on the map at the upper Crocker Trail. Another master plan proposal, land use is called gathering spaces, which have been described as locations for dance and music performance, lectures, outdoor classrooms for middle school students and lunch spots for the surrounding businesses. The gathering spaces seem like a grand idea in search of a purpose. Um, one of the comments in the workshops has been that the name Crocker should be changed to Cañada de Guadalupe. It is worth noting that using the language of the conquistadors may not be any better than the name of a railroad baron. Finally, the intent of resurfacing of the resurfacing grant is to increase bicycle and pedestrian use of the trail system. If there is money left over after resurfacing, I hope that some of this residual money may be spent on bicycle skills features. Bike skill features will encourage even more trail use, so expenditure on these features are consistent with the purpose of the grant. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Ingrid, anybody else have any comments? I have not received any further written correspondences, text messages, and no members of the public wish to speak. Thank you. Discussion time, Derek. So, um, I too got emails about a pump track and had many concerns about it. I really didn't know what a pump track was. And so I went and looked at some videos and it looks like some of the, it could be an item that is just like our skate park where you can go small and homemade or you can go big and fancy. Um, I would not be amenable to be putting it at the far end of the Car Crocker Trail Park because I think that would encourage people to go up into San Bruno Mountain State Park, which does not allow um, off-road bicycles um, or any bicycles. Um, and I understand that this is just a uh, rendering of what is possible and doesn't have funding, but if it seems if people are walking and riding on the trail um, that having activity centers that have bicycles entering and exiting the roadway or the pathway would be very difficult and could be a conflict of use. So I'm glad that this is just an overview. I hope that as we move forward with it, we do respect the, um, wetlands features that are there and present. And I wish we could have come up with the recommendations to save the Cypress area before it uh, had some damage done to it in this most recent cycle. Um, but those are my comments thus far. Thanks, Tark. Holly Madison, Cliff. Say something, I, I tend to agree with um concern that, that Terry just verbalized in that um, to go by the basketball courts or the skate park late at night, there's people using it. You put a pump track in the far end of the industrial park. If you're illuminating it all night, there's going to be people using it. I guarantee you. And I, I have concerns about creating um, some difficulties for the police. I'm not begging for trouble, but the police traverse the area near the basketball courts in the skate park all night long. And I, I think they should have some input on this as well. If there's perhaps a more suitable location for that. Madison, what? I guess I'll start, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, 
you know, I, I, I'm really glad that we had this process. It seems like we've got a lot of folks, you know, coming to the workshops and providing great input. And um, I, I think our consultants, along with our um, park and rec staff, did a great job putting together this master plan. And it's, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, the, the pump track, um, I didn't know what a pump track was until <laughs> this process, you know, and, um, but I did do some, some research and I went out to McLaren park and I, um, saw this pump track that they had and it. it was like, it was really cool. It was dirt. And it, se it seemed, it seemed Brisbane like, you know, like you're talking about Terry, you know, like that home ground, you can do home ground or you can do fancy and, you know, we're definitely more home grown. And, um, and, and so, um, I, I invited Clay and Noreen to go check it out uh, with me because, you know, I'm, I'm ignorant to this type of facility. And it turned out that there was a, a, a person from recreation and park, uh, a, a facility um, manager who was doing some work on the site. And um, he, he was super knowledgeable. And, and it turns out that San Francisco pours a ton of money into maintaining that that pump track which which like wow that, that, that really surprised me but then the guy said hey you know what there's another pump track in mclaren park that's one that's more homegrown and that uh we don't really maintain it but um you know the community does right the bike community parents do and um and we checked it out and it was um it was kind of similar to the one where San Francisco pours a bunch of money into it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it seems like if that is, you know, a direction that the community wants to go into, um, you know, I would definitely be interested in, in exploring it further. Um, you know, I hope that, um, yeah, we can improve those wetland, um, areas in, uh, yeah, it is, it is a tragedy what happened, but, hopefully we move forward with a better plan. Um, yeah. So that, that's about it. I, 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 I hope that we approve this plan and, and, and yeah, move it forward. Madison. I'm open to looking into a pump track. I think that like for us to have really creative and different recreational opportunities is, um, you know, just enhances our community. There was something in, what was it? Our capital improvement plan that was um, at the site of the teen center. What's it called? Bank shot basketball. Bank shot basketball. <laughs> Never heard of that in my entire life. Fascinated, fascinated by so cool. the report on that. And and so, you know, I, I just love the idea of enhancing our facilities and, you know, our recreational areas to include things that you just don't find in every community. And that's one reason why I think our skate park is so popular. It's just, it, there are not a lot of communities that have skate parks and, and people come from all over the place to visit ours. And I want, you know, our recreational opportunities to be like that. Um, and so, what I meant in misleading the public is just that tonight we aren't saying yes, pump track is approved and we're going to go build it tomorrow. Um, what we have before us is an aspirational plan and we've taken community input and we can move forward with the things that we have funding for. Um, and unfortunately we don't have anything in this appendix that discusses what that cost um, for a pump track would be, which is really important for us to know so we can know if that's feasible. And once we have that information back, then if it's the council's pleasure, at that point we can review whether that's possible, how we get funding for that, where the ideal location would be, um, and any kind of timeline. And so, um, you know, I, I would be totally open to exploring it and um, I do understand that there could be some challenges, uh, as Terry mentioned, with bikers and walkers, and I don't know how those would interact. I guess it would depend on where on the trail we placed the pump track. Um, 
and but I think things can I think things can be sorted out and so you know I'm open I'm open to it and I think that we've heard from the community loud and clear that this is a priority and um, once we get those costs back and you know, at a later time, the council can determine there's a lot of things on this list, right? Like there's art projects on this list. And, you know, we, the, the uh, public arts ordinance has money that is generated from construction. And so the public art committee might want to say, hey, okay, so now the master um, plan has been established for Crocker Park and art has been identified as one of the components of that. Perfect, we kind of know what buildings are possible and now we can apply the money that we have to that. And so I think that that's gonna be the same sort of process with the pump track. Um, so I I just want my, my statements earlier were more to clarify for the public because I think people are thinking that we are gonna decide the fate of the pump track right now and this decision you know is going to determine whether we're going to have one shortly after and this is more aspirational um but i think that this is a lot of these things might be feasible too it's not something that's out of the realm of possibility this is something that i think you know if we put our heads together and identify some um some resources we can make possible it's just not like it's going to happen tomorrow so Anyhow, those are my comments. Okay, is there any other comments before I make mine? We do have a raised hand from um, Michael Barnes. Um, Colleen? Um, I, I just wanted to ask if anyone, since it was mentioned about dead trees and underbrush, if anyone's done an assessment of the entire trail as to fire danger and um, making sure that there's a defensible space. I can somewhat speak to that, Colleen. Um, being on the emergency services side of things and subcommittees, the um, North County Fire is definitely looking at that whole area. And, and if in fact there's a need to clear area, that's not part of this funding. So that would be seeking grants? No idea. Okay. No idea. Um, okay. Thank I, they, they may have um, just as part of their plan, but I mean, I, I'm just would be making assumptions at this point. I know they're looking at everything right now very, very closely. Okay, definitely a, an important issue because the closer you bring, bring people to that yeah. operation with the mountain, the more dangerous it is. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Michael. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to mention that I have been to both of the McLaren Park bicycle uh, facilities. I actually did fundraising for the one that's run by the city of San Francisco. I've been involved with the San Francisco Urban Riders for years. I've also done a fair amount of mountain bike riding on mixed use trails, um, mostly in the Southern Sierra where trails are shared not only by bicyclists and hikers, but also by motorcyclists and horseback riders there's really very little conflict. Everybody respects the order of priority and trail passing. It, it really should not be a problem. I wanted to point out one thing, the, uh, the city sponsored uh, mountain bike facility in San Francisco that Cliff mentioned is fenced off and is closed during the rainy season. So if there's an issue, if there's a concern about hours of use, that's one option. And, um, Oh, and again, I would like to see the pump track located on the map. I, under, I think everybody I've talked to understands this is a master plan. Nobody's expecting a track to be built tomorrow. It's not shovel ready, but we just want the, city's, the citizens' view of what's important in the trail system to be respected and included. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. So, um, so I... I totally agree that, you know, we need to make as many different options available as possible. I had no clue what a pump track is and I don't know what this basketball thing is you're talking about either, but it's, uh, it's, it's just exciting to be able to be thinking about bringing, you know, people's passions to life. So from my perspective, 
all we're really doing is approving this master plan. We know that there's some very passionate um, interest in a pump track and I have no clue, you know, where it could be located. You know, um, Michael has said at a certain location, has anybody studied whether that would be a good idea or not? I think if we've got one thing to do tonight and that is to pass the master plan. After that, we can then come back and say, okay, what do the pieces look like? What are the priorities? What are the priorities of the community? What do we look at first? Where can we get money from? And it's, it's all those things. And obviously, you know, if people want a pump track, they're going to figure out some way to try and get it. And that's okay with me. So um, I think at, as I think Michael made it clear that he understood we weren't passing a pump track tonight. He wants it on a map. We've got to talk about that moving forward. Where would it be appropriate to have it on the map? Acknowledging that we're not saying no, we're not going to have a pump track is very important, but um, that's not our order of business this evening. Our order of business is to, do I have a first and a second to approve the final Crocker Trail Master Plan? So moved. Second. Okay, second. Colleen can have it. Colleen can have it, okay. <laughs> Roll call, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll keep talking about this thing. Okay. Moving on. Um, item H is to consider approval of an agreement to pay staff and consultants costs concerning a proposed project to redevelop the 144 acre quarry property adjacent to Brisbane. Staff report, please. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. Developer Orchard Partners is in the process of acquiring the quarry site. Their intent is to develop the quarry with a uh, industrial project consistent with Crocker Park. Um, they'll be making a presentation to the council um, later this summer as to some of their ideas for that particular project. Um, but we don't have that information this evening. Um, there are a number of approvals will be required by the city to allow for that um, kind of project to proceed. These include, but are not limited to, an environmental impact report, a specific plan, potentially a general plan amendment, um, an annexation and pre-zoning because the site lies within the boundaries of unincorporated San Mateo County and would need to be annexed to Brisbane and also a habitat conservation plan operating program. So there's some of the key um, steps they're gonna have to go through. Um, Orchard will be responsible for all the costs associated with the processing of their application and the payment agreement before you tonight sort of sets forth the terms uh, for that. Key terms include that the developer will be responsible for the full cost of any consultant um, contracts or, or costs, and that there will also be a 20% admin fee to pay for staff processing costs as well. So it means that there's a million dollar contract, an EIR contract, that there'd be a $200,000 administrative charge in addition to the million dollars to pay for staff's time as well. And there are also some provisions in there that speak to making sure the fund is kept at an acceptable balance. Um, so we don't have a situation where work is occurring without uh, payment, you know, a fund balance being available to pay for work. So with that, staff's recommending approval of the attached agreement and I'm glad to answer any questions you have. Any questions for John? Terry. Um, so this is the first, I didn't sit on any of the subcommittees that may have heard about this. So this is the first time I've heard about the a proposed development going on there. Um, would this, are there requirements going to be to adhere to the previously um, submitted uh, reclamation plan that was on record from, gosh, back in the 80s? They may end up revising the reclamation plan because it's 
the reclamation plan is typically tied to the final development to some extent, final grades and areas of disturbance. So I suspect they'll also update the reclamation plan. Okay, and they've been made aware of that document? Or do you? Yes, they've done, they've done a lot of due diligence with the county and the city as to um, the permit history. Okay. Because I know it's a pretty um, intensive thing to do the reclamation on that. And, and I have not been up into the quarry area for quite a while, um, but it appears that the basic floor of the quarry has been completely changed. Um, over the last few years. Um, okay, thank you. Questions? Madison, call me. What? No? Discussion? I'm getting nods. Okay, then. I move that we uh, approve the agreement with Orchard Partners to pay for staff and consultants costs concerning their proposal to develop the 144 acre quarry property. Great, thank you, roll call vote. There are no public comments on, on this item as well. Oh. Um, I'll have Council Member Davis. Hi. Council Member Lentz. Hi. Council Member Mackin. Hi. Council Member O'Connell. Hi. And Mayor Cunningham. Hi, thank you. Um, item eight is new business. Update the cooperative agreement between the City of Brisbane and the Brisbane School District. Report, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the cooperative agreement for the shared use of public facilities and programs between the City of Brisbane and the Brisbane Elementary, or the Brisbane School District, actually, was established in 2000 with a couple of iterations since. The agreement encompasses use of classrooms and spaces within school buildings, athletic fields, the swimming pool, tennis courts, and the BES lower field restroom. The City of Brisbane and the school district have remained collaborative partners to ensure adequate service delivery to residents and students. The cooperative agreement has allowed for shared infrastructure and operating costs of recreational facilities and programs to meet the needs of the community. As recreational and educational needs and trends shift, it's essential for both parties to reconvene to ensure that the agreement re remains current. Uh, the two by two committee met earlier this year to review the cooperative agreement and along with city and district staff proposed amendments and discussed continuation of the agreement into the future. Modifications to the agreement include minor revisions, an updated cost contribution schedule and a more accurate reflection of the current use of facilities by both parties. Uh, noteworthy revisions include updating of the name of the Lipman Multipurpose Room to the Ray Monte Gymnasium throughout the document, inclusion of a provision for maintenance of the tennis courts and fields, uh, removal of 2.06, which uh, specifies the city's previous use of the interior school restrooms at BES that is no longer needed, updates to the language regarding the BES child care modular following the installation of the new modular earlier this year, and uh, Lipman Homework Center reclassified throughout the document for continuity as the Club Lipman After School Program. And finally, the adjustments to the cost contribution schedule to reflect the restructured amounts. Although those changes have been made to the cost contribution schedule, uh, they result in a no net increase nor require a budgetary adjustment for either party. Uh, the city contributes $50,000 annually to the Lipman, Club Lipman after school program and $33,756 um, annually for the remaining items outlined in the cost contribution schedule. Council is being asked this evening to amend and restate the cooperative agreement between the city and the school district for the shared use of public facilities and programs. And I believe uh, we have the superintendent of the school district here with us this evening. So thanks for joining us, Ronan. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, questions for Noreen or Ronan? Give them all to Ronan. Oh, there you go. Okay, Ronan, they're all yours. <laughs> any questions for Ronan? So I'm surprised they've changed the name um, from Brisbane Elementary to just Brisbane School District. Is that going to change our parent-teacher BES? <laughs> well, 
well, Brisbane Elementary School will still be BES, but the district itself is Brisbane School District, as I understand it. Okay. That's the only question I have. <laughs> Any questions or comments for Ronan? Since he's here, come on. You don't get him for at Ronan had to wait till 10 15 tonight. Right? Sorry, sir. <laughs> He hasn't been in the house the whole time, though. No, he has. He has. has. He? Yeah, He's been here since it started. Really? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, well, good for him. <laughs> Ronan, we noticed your presence. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the great job you do with uh, the school district and, and the community as a whole. Appreciate it. Okay. It doesn't look like we have any questions for Ronan or for Noreen. Do we have any questions from the public or comments or whatever? Does Ronan want to say anything? He's just got that smile right now. Anybody from the public, Ingrid? No, I have, uh, Madam Mayor, I have not received any, any ring correspondence or text messages. No members of the public wish to speak. Okay, Ronan, do you want to say something since you're here? He fell asleep. We took so long on our meeting. He fell asleep. I was going to say he might have dozed off. He was like, <laughs> he may have. Oh, he just doesn't want to unmute himself. That's okay. Thank you. Okay, so with that, is there a first and second to approve in the update to the cooperative agreement between the city of Brisbane and the Brisbane School District? Okay, I'll make the motion that we approve the amended and restated cooperative agreement between the city of Brisbane and Brisbane school district for the use shared use of public facilities and programs. I will second that. Oops. Madison got the second first. Okay. Roll call please. Council member Davis. Aye. Council member Lentz. Aye. Council member Mackin. Aye. Council member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Thank you very much. Okay. You you can have some fun now, Ronan. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to item nine, staff reports. Uh, city managers report on upcoming activities, please, Stuart. Yes, I will wait for the PowerPoint to come up. Okay. So we have the annual vegetation reduction abatement program. The first inspections were being conducted by the North County Fire Authority's inspectors, June 1st through June 6th. Second letters will be mailed out on June 10th. And the city will started its own annual weed abatement last week and will be completed by July 4th. Next slide. Uh, to let you know, we, we told you we would keep you informed about when the master arm installation started, would go on in, on Bayshore. It's going to start tomorrow at 8 p.m. This is the no U-turn signs that you had approved previously. So that will be starting tomorrow. The work will happen between 8 p.m. and 12 a.m. So please use alternate routes during this time if possible. When the master arm is placed over the roadway and secured, there will be approximately a 15 minute temporary closure on northbound Bayshore just south of San Bruno Avenue. Once the work is completed and signage is placed, U-turns will be prohibited in both directions at this intersection. That was a that was a program that the city council looked at a number a couple of years ago to in order to make the Bayshore San Bruno intersection safer. And this Saturday, there's the wildfire awareness, Saturday, June 5th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Brisbane Community Park. Uh, this is an annual event for us. It will, there will be a number of people who will be there and also there will be some snacks available. So free food. So please show up. The San Mateo, to give an update on the San Mateo Credit Union update. We are making progress on bringing an agreement to the city council regarding having an ATM at city hall that is expected to be brought forward before the council summer recess. So that's good news for that's good news to be able to bring some banking services back into the city after Bank of America left. Um, 
Volunteer Habitat Day, June 12th, 2021. Please, registration is required and the details will be at mountainwatch.org. We are limiting it to 30 people, so space is limited. Please sign up as soon as you can. The sponsors of this are San Bruno Mountain Watch, South San Francisco Scavengers, the City of Brisbane's Parks and Recreation Commission and Open Space and Ecology Committee. And accordingly, it says starts at eight at the bottom, starts at 9.30 a.m. Meet at Quarry Road as earlier, as of earlier today, there was only eight spots left. So this is a one of the must be at events in the city. And then please save the date for September 12th, which is the Sunday after Labor Day. San Bruno Mountain Watch is going, will have their annual pancake breakfast and plant sale. So please, as many people as can, please attend that. Always a good event. And on the 25th, we're going to do Luna Fest. This is the 20th anniversary, so that's gonna be very exciting. We are doing two shows that day. We're gonna do 1 p.m. So that will be more of a family oriented show. And then at 6 p.m., we're going to be doing a more of, more for adults. It will be more of a VIP with, um, there will be an after viewing party available. We'll have a dance party at that time. So. We're very excited about that. And that is all of the exciting things that I have for you tonight. Okay. So moving on to item 10, Mayor Council Matters. Item K, create a council ad hoc committee on upcoming community events. So, so that's me again. This is uh, the there have been a number of suggested special events uh, that we, part of it is we've postponed a number of things over the, over the last year for a good reason. Um, but, you know, to let you know, we are having the concerts in the park. They're commencing in September on Sunday afternoons and the day in the park is going to be the first Saturday in October. But in addition, there has been ideas of having a vegan food truck festival we are also looking at doing a celebration for the opening of the new Brisbane Library. Also, over the past 30 years, we've had, every five years, we've had a celebration for the city of incorporation. So this would be our, this would be our 50th, our 60th year. So the question is, do we wanna do that? Um, so what we would like to know is if we're, we, we would like is to have the council create an ad hoc subcommittee to work on special events in the upcoming year. So that way we can work together to figure out when we can have events and what events the city council would like us to work on. So we're hoping for two volunteers from the city council to do this. I volunteer. So Madam Mayor, just to note, um, council member Mackin is re-logging back in. Oh. oh. She missed everything I said. <laughs> Can just I'll repeat everything. We can just appoint uh, a committee in her absence. Just kidding. She can watch the video, Stuart. Okay, fine. So I think this might need to be, this is a one council member ad hoc, right? We were looking for two council members for the ad hoc committee. Because um, one of the events is a, one of the proposed events would benefit the chamber. So I would need to be able to be on the subcommittee um, representing the chamber. So I don't think that would leave room for another council person. Um, and anything that would be voted on would need to be, I would need to recuse myself from, but I think that I would have to be at those meetings as a chamber representative, which means if there was two council people, that would, I think, lend itself to being a serial meeting. So I think it would likely need to be an ad hoc with one council member and me there as the chamber representative. I'll ask Tom for an opinion on that, if she can be there as a chamber as the chamber rep, not being a council member. She, if we can about be, she can be there. She would need to disclose it. As I understand the committee, and I, I want to be, I spoke to Clay about it this afternoon. The 
committee will be making recommendations. If any action is required by the council, it would make recommendations to the council. The council as a whole would be voting on those recommendations. The, the committee would not have authority to do anything other than gather the information and make the recommendations. Is that correct? That, that would be my understanding as well. That was Clay's as well for the record. So in that instance, uh, there is a recognition and it should be acknowledged as, as has been the case by uh, Councilwoman Davis that she has a relationship with the chamber and if she presents before that committee and participates in the discussion, that is not a violation of the Brown Act as long as she recuses herself from the vote and the discussion at the council uh, meeting because this committee won't be voting 2-0 to take a recommendation part. They'll report in or not report in on recommendations after they've met. So there's no, there's no action that she is influencing by sitting in on a meeting and representing her, uh, her work. That's fine. She just has to be recused from the actual discussion and decision by the council. So um, Tom, I have a question for you. So I'm the race director of the San Bruno Mountain Half Marathon. Oh yeah, you've got a conflict no matter what. I, I ruled that earlier today. Go ahead, Cliff. Sorry. <laughs> so can I can I go before the ad hoc committee and say, hey, I, I you know I've been working with the county and uh, we've had this race the last couple of years. We'd like to do it again. Um, and then I guess then the, the ad hoc committee then would then bring it before the council and then I would have to recuse myself from making a decision. So my, my advice would be that anybody who has an interest such as yours or Madison's as the chamber president uh, should not seek to be on the ad hoc committee. No. If you're not on the ad hoc committee, I just want to establish that. If you're not on the ad hoc committee and the ad hoc committee only has power to bring a recommendation forward to the council, then you can participate in the discussion, but you cannot participate in the council discussion or the vote on it. And this is where there's an appearance of a conflict, but there's not actually a conflict. You're talking to other council members about your work interest and you are not gonna participate in the actual council discussion or vote on it at a later date. The two recusals would mean that the council would need to be unanimous on whatever the suggestion, whatever the recommendation was. For Is me. the race tied to the same? I understood um, your event, Councilwoman Davis, as being a proposed vegan chamber fundraiser, vegan food truck, I think, chamber fundraiser. Is, is Councilmember Lentz's race the same event? Well, nothing's been discussed, but I know that uh, in the past, Cliff's race coincided with... Um, coincided with the Star City Music Festival. And now we don't have the Star City Music Festival, but we have day in, uh, concerts in the park during the day this year. So I was thinking of lining up um, the Vegan Food Festival, possibly with one of the um, co daytime concerts in the park in order to ensure that there's enough attendees. And it sounds like Cliff is, has that same vision too. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Cliff. No, that, that's correct. You know, um, yeah, we, we talked a little bit about it, um, in regards to, Hey, I, I want to do this race. I'd like to get people who come to the race interested in, in hanging out in Brisbane and, and, um, you know, contributing to the local economy. And, um, if we did a, you know, a, a, a vegan food festival, then they could participate in that. So it, if we're going to have uh, A and B, if the notion is that the race and the chamber would both be involved in the vegan food festival, one festival, and both of you would be talking to two other council members in an ad hoc committee meeting, I can't imagine we can pass the smell test on appearance of conflict, even with a 3-0 vote. It's just, it looks like four council members making a decision informally. Can I, it's, uh, Councilwoman O'Connell. I, I think the easy way to say this is to not make an ad hoc subcommittee and the these items just get discussed in a council meeting. Then they refuse. Um, but I can't discuss them then. I don't think I 
Can I discuss you can them present, and just not refuse? You can present. Right. You can may, present. May, 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 I make a, may I make a suggestion? So <laughs> there are a number of other types of special events that we do want to talk about, such as the potentially a 60th anniversary. Um, and if there's any other kinds of things that the city council would like to talk about, maybe what we just do is remove the, you know, we bring the vegan food festival. We work with uh, the chamber and we work with the race committee to determine what is needed for that separately and bring that back to the whole council. But we have the ad hoc special events committee in case there's other special events in addition to the 60th anniversary that you would want to plan for the next year or two. So can I reword that modestly? Just Absolutely. Uh, if you form an ad hoc committee, any issue, any event that would pose a conflict for a council member would have to go before the full council for presentation and action minus the recused members. So the ad hoc committee by resolution tonight would not be permitted to take up an event for discussion individually that involves the recusal of a council member. You just want to eliminate every appearance of conflict we can without, <clears throat> without so overreacting that you block yourself. What, what I take that to mean is that neither Cliff nor Madison would need to recuse themselves from being on this ad hoc committee because they would not be discussing some that event. Any event, any event that would involve a recusal <clears throat> of a council member would have to go before the full council period. So right. not just those two, any of that. Should we make it simple and just have it be Cliff and I? I know Karen was interested. Well, Karen, Karen had asked if she, Karen oh, volunteered to be on the, on it first. I saw. Yeah. I think Karen should be on it. So, you know what, you know what, Madison, maybe it's, maybe I should just, I know that Mountain Watch also makes <laughs> Michelle's on the, you know, watching the meeting, but she was also hoping that maybe our race was, you know, the same day as the pancake breakfast, you know, so, um, yeah, I don't want to make it complicated. Um, so that could be good because then you guys could do that, like trade thing that you've been talking about. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We, don't, we don't want to get into that. Okay. 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 Sorry. Sorry. It's getting late. So it sounds like you got it figured out, Cliff. Okay. So I think so. If we can just get one more council member to volunteer for this ad hoc committee. Or are you can have an individual, either one. Can I be on it? As yes. long as you don't take up your item, yes. Okay. And we won't take up your item. Let's be done with it. So Karen and Madison are, have, are the volunteers. Yes. So, and, we, and so we, we can discuss the vegan food festival or no, no. in the ad hoc? Councilwoman Davis, you would bring the, it, because the vegan food festival would lead to a recusal, you would present that to the full council, not to the right. committee. So basically what would happen is that the city staff would work with the chamber to work on the details of that and bring that item back to the full council. To the full Got council it. as opposed to the committee. And we'll, and we'll work with you as, as a chamber person, not as a council member. Great. We and we'll work with Cliff as a as a race director, not as a council member, and bring that idea back to the full council. Okay. So, is there a first and second to approve the creation of the council ad hoc committee for on upcoming community events? I'll I didn't. We motion. needed to vote on that, but <laughs> I'll make a motion. It's on my sheet, so we're voting on it. Okay. okay. And to appoint Karen uh, and Madison to it. Yeah, and that was my intention. Okay, I second that. And we'll add in the part, unless somebody objects, we'll add in a few sentences about if an item for recusal presents, it will go to the full council. We'll add that to the end. Okay. Okay, roll call, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lent? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Thank you very much. Um, for Padilla, I'm just seeing that there was a raised hand. Is that on this event or is that previous? Um, I think it was this discussion, I'm sorry. That was um, previous. Previous. Thank you. <coughs> okay, moving on to item L, countywide assignments and subcommittee reports. Who would like to start? Cliff, I nominate you. All right, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so uh, Terry and I had a SharePoint design guidelines meeting just to kind of 
you know, um, you know, just kind of regroup uh, in regards to the uh, the proposals that have been presented to us um, from Health Peak, uh, but mostly um, uh, UPC BDI, or I think they're called something else out at Zero Point. Um, and we we talked about uh, the you know, the the need for dealing with traffic. You know, if, if there is going to be a potential uh, um, development out there that goes beyond what has already been um, allowed, then there needs to be, um, you know, demand, um, traffic demand management uh, plan. But then we also talked about, well, maybe we should be looking at all of Brisbane since, um, you know, there's these potential uh, developments on our horizon. And where should that uh, be discussed? And we thought, well, let's, let's bring it to the council to see if there is, um, um, you know, approval to perhaps form an ad hoc committee, such as the one that we just talked about. So is, is that uh, kind of where we were, Terry? Um, am I on? I can't even tell. Yes, I am. Um, yeah, and we also talked about water um, yeah. in proposed with that proposal, and whether we were going to need, and when maybe not even an ad hoc, it might need that we're going to need a transportation specialist to come in and look at what's going on, or it may need to go to the complete streets. Um, but there's quite a few issues that we need to talk about there. And I, I don't think we're going to get into too many details here, um, but we needed to sort of figure out what direction we needed to go on that for help and figuring out what uh, transit demand and freeway and on-ramps and off-ramps are going to be. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, we, we talked about uh, how CCAG is putting forth uh, something and East Palo Alto is also doing the same at, at a citywide level. And so um, if uh, the council is okay, you know, putting this on our next agenda to see, um, does it make sense to form uh, an ad hoc committee to look at some of these uh, uh, traffic demand management uh, issues? Can I ask just that, that if you bring it back, can you give us like a menu of things that you think need to be done? Because it sounds like some you might need a consultant and others you could really utilize complete streets to do some studies. Well, I think, that, I, think that? I think that's all gonna need to be sort of based on what the will of the council is. Um, there's just two really big projects that have been broached there um and so i think it's going to need a little more explanation on what what we're going to need to go forward and i think it it should be a discussion with the full council yeah i, I agree and and putting it on uh the agenda um gives us that opportunity to discuss it in, in greater detail and staff can uh provide uh, some options for us Anything else, Cliff? That is it, Madam Mayor. Terry? I'll go next, I guess. Um, so I had an SFO roundtable um, technical working group meeting last week, and we discussed GBAS, which is the controlled landing, the night hush, which may give us some relief that is getting planes out over the bay and having them go out the gate um, only between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. Um, and turning, going further out before they make a turn and come back over the peninsula. That was really good news. And then I had an SFO roundtable meeting last night and the uh, proverbial stuff hit the fan where, um, the roundtable is looking 
at changing their memorandum of understanding with all of the cities to allow Palo Alto to join and looking at what those implications would be that uh, passed um, a vote to create a subcommittee to look at those implications. I voted no on it. And consequently, I got put on the subcommittee to look at it as the only person willing to be on it that voted no. Um, just so that we have a little bit of balance. We'll see how that goes. Good job, uh, Terry. And once once we get a little bit more information out of that subcommittee, I'll bring it back and we can discuss it and council can give me direction on how they want me to keep going on that item. I will say that we had um, support from some of our Northern uh, city members and I applauded them for following my lead once uh, they saw which way the wind was gonna blow. Um, and we'll just see how that goes down the road. And I think that's all I had in the last week and a half, two weeks. So, so Tara, who's pushing for Palo Alto to join? Palo Alto. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and you know, they're gonna take all the all resources the other, and suck out all the energy. All the Southern cities sided with them and even South San Francisco. Who's on that, that, who's the South City rep? Oh, don't even ask me. It's too late to go through the names. It, the meeting yeah. went very yeah. late last night and it was very, very it's tenacious. I bet, I bet. 41. Let's move on. Yes, yeah. so that's right. it. Colleen? Okay, I'll try to make it quick. Peninsula Clean Energy, I met on May 27th. Uh, last time I brought up Peninsula Clean Energy, I've been asked on acronyms to explain. If I say PCE, it's Peninsula Clean Energy. Um, last time I talked about the SB 612, the Portentino bill, which is to reform the billing that's done by PG&E, who's still billing customers on um, PCE for what they call a PCIA charge legacy resources. And this is to reform that billing. So we either get the legacy resources or they stop billing us. And it did pass out of the Senate Energy Utilities and Communications Committee. So it's headed for appropriations next. Good move. Um, there's an e-bikes program kicked off very recently, there were instantly 100 applications. There's only 300 rebates. Those rebates are up to $800 residents with low to moderate incomes. So it's anticipated probably by the time I'm giving you this report that all the rebates are gone. But now PCE's uh, going to consider funding more bike rebates since it was such a success. And the final note, just interesting that energy consumption by commercial and residential customers, it's pretty close now back to the level of usage that was in March 2020, which we would call beginning of the pandemic. That's all I have. Thank you. Madison. Uh, the only subcommittee I had was with you. We met on public art committee. Um, just kind of talking about next steps. Um, I think I reported this out last time, but just in case we are not moving forward with the mural at the um, skate park. So we're trying to reevaluate what happens now. Um, we found during the process, there were a number of hiccups relative to the public arts ordinance that I think contributed to um, the outcome that we had, which was not moving forward. And so the public art committee is looking at some revisions to the ordinance that it's going to recommend to council for our next meeting. I was curious, uh, Madison, are, are you guys also, um in discussions in, in regards to uh, hiring a consultant to help yes. you? we discussed mm -hmm. it. Okay. We discussed it last meeting as well. 
Exactly. That was it for me too. So moving on. So we are now uh, item and city council meeting scheduled. The next uh, council meeting is scheduled for June 17. And item N, written communications, Ingrid. Written communication was received from Irene W. regarding SAM trends, cutting 292 from Brisbane to San Francisco. As mentioned, we received 13 correspondences regarding the bike bicycle pump. Um, that's from Michael Barnes, Jim Radcliffe, Alex Coriano, Thuver Ray, Deanna Pritzker, Matthew Blaine, Lindsay, Lindsay Miller, Dan Carter, Mike Lelevelt, Car um, Kateri Paul, Julie Maniak, Elizabeth, and Robert L Larson, plus three kids, Janet Thompson. And we also received um, correspondent, two correspondences from Daniel Dilworth regarding capital improvement projects and Crocker Trail and Master Plan. Meryl Sokoler regarding floodlights from Amazon Fresh pointing to Altamar at the Ridge. And we also re received um, correspondence from Akash Joppi regarding um, public comment on housing authority item. A lot of correspondence, thank you. <coughs> Moving on to item 11, oral communications number two. Are there any members of the public wishing to make public comment at this point? I can read Ronan Culver's um, response. On behalf of the Brisbane School District, I would like to thank the City of Brisbane for their continued support of the edu education of the children in our community. Our partnership with the city is one aspect that makes it, this community a very special place. Sorry for the late statement. I had a group of sheep that required some necessary counting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> yeah. Anything uh -huh. else? At least he's up front about it. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else, Ingrid? No. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we will now adjourn to the City Council meeting of June 15th. Thank you and good night, everybody. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.